The Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer, edited by D. Lang Purves. This reading is based on the book The Canterbury Tales and Other Poems. The original text contains poems by Chaucer and a lot of notes and explanations by the editor. To view these, please click on the Gutenberg e-text link on the LibriVox catalog page of the Canterbury Tales. Now for the Parson's Tale. The Prologue. By that the Manciple his tale had ended. The sun from the south line was descended so low that it was not to my sight degrees nine and twenty as in height. Four of the clock it was then, as I guess, for eleven foot a little more or less, my shadow was at thilk time, as there of such feet as my length parted were in six feet equal of proportion. Therewith the moon's exultation in mean Libra, gone alway ascend as we were entering at a thorpe's end, for which our host, as he was wont to guy, as in this case our jolly company, said in this wise, Lordings, every one, now lacketh us no more tales than one. Fulfilled is my sentence and my decree. I trow that we have heard of each degree. Almost fulfilled is mine ordinance. I pray to God so give him right good chance that telleth us this tale lustily. Sir Priest, quoth he, art thou a vicary, or art thou a parson, say sooth by thy fay? Be what thou be, break thou not our play, for every man, save thou, hath told his tale. Unbuckle and show us what is in thy mail, for truly me thinketh by thy cheer thou shouldest knit up well a great matter. Tell us a fable anon for cock's bones. This parson him answered all at once. Thou gettest fable, none he told for me, for Paul, that writeth unto Timothy, reproveth them that weave soothfastness, and tell fables, and such wretchedness. Why should I so draft out of my fist, when I may so wheat, if that me list? For which I say, if that you list to hear morality and virtuous matter, and then what ye will give me audience, I would full fain at Christ's reverence do you pleasure lawful as I can. But trust well, I am a southern man. I cannot jest, roam, ram, rough, by my letter, and God wot, rhyme whole I but little better. And therefore, if you list, I will not glose. I will you tell a little tale in prose, To knit up all this feast and make an end. And Jesus, for his grace, would me send To shew you the way in this voyage Of thilk perfect glorious pilgrimage, That height Jerusalem celestial. And if ye vouchsafe, anon I shall begin upon my tale, for which I pray, tell your advice, I can no better say. But nathless this meditation, I put it I under correction of clerks, for I am not textual. I take but the sentence, trust me well. Therefore I make a protestation that I will stand to correction. Upon this word we have assented soon, for as us seemed, it was for to doon, to end in, in some virtuous sentence, and for to give him space and audience, and bade our host he should to him say that all we to tell his tale him pray. Our host had the words for us all. Sir Priest, quoth he, now fare you be fall, say what you list, and we shall gladly hear. And with that word he said in this manner, Tell, quoth he, your meditation, But hasten you, the sun will adown, Be fructuous, and that in little space, And to do well God send you his grace. And now the parson's tale.
Our sweet Lord, God of heaven, that no man will perish, but will that we come all to the knowledge of him, and to the blissful life that is perdurable, admonishes us by the prophet Jeremiah, that saith in this wise, Stand upon the ways, and see and ask of old paths, that is to say of old sentences, which is the good way, and walk in that way, and ye shall find refreshing for your souls. Many be the spiritual ways that lead folk to our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the reign of glory, of which ways there is a full noble way, and full convenable, which may not fall to man nor to woman, that through sin hath misgone from the right way of Jerusalem celestial. And this way is called penitence, of which men should gladly hearken and inquire with all their hearts, to wit, what is penitence, and whence it is called penitence, and in what manner, and in how many manners, be the actions or workings of penitence, and how many species there be of penitences, and what things appertain and behove to penitence, and what things disturb penitence. Penitence is described on the authority of Saints Ambrose, Isidore, and Gregory as the bewailing of sin that has been wrought, with the purpose never again to do that thing, or any other thing, which a man should bewail. For weeping, and not ceasing to do the sin, will not avail, though it is to be hoped that after every time that a man falls, be it ever so often, he may find grace to arise through penitence. And repentant folk that leave their sin, ere sin leave them, are accounted by holy church sure of their salvation, even though the repentance be at the last hour. There are three actions of penitence, that a man be baptized after he has sinned, that he do no deadly sin after receiving baptism, and that he fall into no venial sins from day to day. Thereof, saith St. Augustine, that penitence of good and humble folk is the penitence of every day. The species of penitence are three. Solemn, when a man is openly expelled from Holy Church in Lent, or is compelled by Holy Church to do open penance for an open sin openly talked of in the country. Common penance, enjoined by priests in certain cases as to go on pilgrimage, naked or barefoot. And privy penance, which men do daily for private sins, of which they confess privately, and receive private penance. To very perfect penitence are behoveful and necessary three things, contrition of heart, confession of mouth, and satisfaction, which are fruitful penitence against delight in thinking, reckless speech, and wicked sinful works. Penitence may be likened to a tree having its root in contrition, biting itself in the heart as a tree root does in the earth. Out of this root springs a stalk that bears branches and leaves of confession and fruit of satisfaction. Of this root also springs a seed of grace, which is mother of all security, and this seed is eager and hot, and the grace of this seed springs of God through remembrance on the day of judgment and on the pains of hell. The heat of this seed is the love of God, and the desire of everlasting joy, and this heat draws the heart of man to God, and makes him hate his sin. Penance is the tree of life to them that receive it. In penance or contrition man shall understand four things. What is contrition? What are the causes that move a man to contrition? How he should be contrite? And what contrition availeth to the soul? Contrition is the heavy and grievous sorrow that a man receiveth in his heart for his sins, with earnest purpose to confess and do penance, and never more to sin. Six causes ought to move a man to contrition. 1. He should remember him of his sins. 2. 
he should reflect that sin putteth a man in great thraldom, and all the greater the higher is the estate from which he falls. 3. He should dread the day of doom, and the horrible pains of hell. 4. The sorrowful remembrance of the good deeds that man hath omitted to do here on earth, and also the good that he hath lost, ought to make him have contrition. 5. So also ought the remembrance of the passion that our Lord Jesus Christ suffered for our sins. 6. And so ought the hope of three things, that is to say, forgiveness of sin, the gift of grace to do well, and the glory of heaven, with which God shall reward man for his good deeds. All these points the parson illustrates and enforces at length, waxing especially eloquent under the third head, and plainly setting forth the sternly realistic notions regarding future punishments that were entertained in the time of Chaucer. Certes, all the sorrow that a man might make from the beginning of the world is but a little thing, at retard of the sorrow of hell. The cause why that Job calleth hell the land of darkness. 4. Understand that he calleth it land or earth, for it is stable, and never shall fail, and dark, for he that is in hell hath default of light natural. For certes the dark light that shall come out of the fire that ever shall burn shall turn them all to pain that be in hell, for it sheweth them the horrible devils that them torment. Covered with the darkness of death, that is to say, that he that is in hell shall have default of the sight of God. For certes, the sight of God is the life perdurable. The darkness of death be the sins that the wretched man hath done, which that disturb him to see the face of God, right as a dark cloud doth between us and the sun. Land of misease, because there be three manner of defaults against three things that folk of this world have in this present life, that is to say, honors, delights, and riches. Against honor have they in hell shame and confusion, for well ye wot that men call honor the reverence that man doth to man. But in hell is no honor nor reverence. For certes no more reverence shall be done there to a king than to a knave. For which God saith by the prophet Jeremiah, The folk that me despise shall be in despite. Honor is also called great lordship. There shall be no white serve other but of harm and torment. Honor is also called great dignity and highness. But in hell shall they be all foretrodden of devils. As God saith, the horrible devils shall go and come upon the heads of damned folk. And this is forasmuch as the higher that they were in this present life, the more shall they be abated and defouled in hell. Against the riches of this world shall they have misease of poverty, and this poverty shall be in four things. In default of treasure, of which David saith, The rich folk that embraced and owned all their heart to treasure of this world shall sleep in the sleeping of death, and nothing shall they find in their hands of all their treasure. And moreover, the misease of hell shall be in default of meat and drink. For God saith, Thus by Moses they shall be wasted with hunger, and the birds of hell shall devour them with bitter death, and the gall of the dragon shall be their drink, and the venom of the dragon their morsels. And furthermore their misease shall be in default of clothing, for they shall be naked in body, as of clothing save the fire in which they burn, and other filths. And naked shall they be in soul of all manner of virtues, which, that is, the clothing 
of the soul. Where be then the gay robes, and the soft sheets, and the fine shirts? Lo, what saith of them? The prophet Isaiah, that under them shall be strewed moths, and their covertures shall be of worms of hell. And furthermore their misease shall be in default of friends, for he is not poor that hath good friends. But there is no friend, for neither God nor any good creature shall be friend to them, and ever reach of them shall hate other with deadly hate. The sons and the daughters shall rebel against father and mother, and kindred against kindred, and chide and despise each other both day and night, as God saith by the prophet Micah. And the loving children, that whom love so fleshly each other, would each of them eat the other if they might. For how should they love together in the pains of hell, when they hated each other in the prosperity of this life? For trust well, their fleshly love was deadly hate. As saith the prophet David, Whoso loveth wickedness, he hateth his own soul. And whoso hateth his own soul, certes he may love none other, white in no manner. And therefore in hell is no solace, nor no friendship, but ever the more kindreds that be in hell, the more cursing, the more chiding, and the more deadly hate there is among them. And further over, they shall have default of all manner delights, for certes delights be after the appetites of the five wits, as sight, hearing, smelling, savoring, and touching. But in hell their sight shall be full of darkness and of smoke, and their eyes full of tears, and their hearing full of lamenting, and gnashing of teeth, as saith Jesus Christ. Their nostrils shall be full of stinking, and, as saith Isaiah the prophet, their tasting shall be full of bitter gall, and touching of all their body shall be covered with fire that never shall quench, and with worms that never shall die, as God saith by the mouth of Isaiah. And forasmuch as they shall not wane, that they may die for pain, and by death flee from pain, that may they understand in the word of Job, that saith, There is the shadow of death. Certes, a shadow hath the likeness of the thing of which it is shadowed, but the shadow is not the same thing of which it is shadowed. Right so fareth the pain of hell. It is like death for the horrible anguish. And why? For it paineth them ever, as though they should die anon. But certes they shall not die. For as saith St. Gregory, To wretched caitiffs shall be given death without death, and end without end, and default without failing. For their death shall always live, and their end shall evermore begin, and their default shall never fail. And therefore saith St. John the Evangelist, they shall follow death, and they shall not find him, and they shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And eke Job saith, That in hell is no order of rule, and albeit that God hath created all things in right order, and nothing without order, but all things be ordered and numbered, yet nevertheless they that be damned be not in order nor hold no order. For the earth shall bear them no fruit. For as the prophet David saith, God shall destroy the fruit of the earth as for them. Nor water shall give them no moisture, nor the air no refreshing, nor the fire no light. For as saith St. Basil, the burning of the fire of this world shall God give in hell to them that be damned, but the light and the clearness shall be given in heaven to his children, right as the good man giveth flesh to his children, and bones to his hounds. And for they shall have no hope to escape, saith Job at last, that there shall horror and grisly dread dwell without end. Horror is always dread of harm that is to come, and this dread shall ever dwell in the hearts of them that be damned. And therefore have they lost all their hope for seven causes. 
First, for God, that is, their judge, shall be without mercy to them, nor they may not please him, nor none of his saints, nor they may give nothing for their ransom, nor they have no voice to speak to him, nor they may not flee from pain, nor they have no goodness in them, that they may shew to deliver them from pain. The courteous Lord Jesus Christ will that no good work be lost, for in somewhat it shall avail. But forasmuch as the good works that men do while they be in good life be all uh, killed or deadened by sin following, and also since all the good works that men do while they be in deadly sin be utterly dead, as for to have the life perdurable, well may that man that no good works doth sing that new French song, J'ai tout perdu, mon temps et mon labour. For certes, sin bereaveth a man both the goodness of nature and eke the goodness of grace. For soothly the grace of the Holy Ghost fareth like fire, that may not be idle, for fire faileth anon as it forletteth its working, and right so grace faileth anon as it forletteth its working. Then loseth the sinful man the goodness of glory that only is to good men, that labor and work well may be he sorry then that oweth all his life to god as long as he hath lived and also as long as he shall live that no goodness hath to pay with his debt to god to whom he oweth all his life for trust well he shall give account as saith st bernard of all the goods that have been given him in the his present life, and how he hath them dispended, insomuch that there shall not perish a hair of his head, nor a moment of an hour shall not perish of his time, that he shall not give thereof a reckoning. That is to say, at every time that a man eateth and drinketh more than sufficeth to the sustenance of his body, in certain he doth sin. Eek when he speaketh more than he it needeth, he doth sin. Eek when he heareth not benignly the complaint of the poor. Eek when he is in health of body, and will not fast when other folk fast, without cause reasonable. Eek when he sleepeth more than needeth, or when he cometh by that occasion too late to church, or to other works of charity. Eek when he useth his wife without sovereign desire of enjondur to the honor of God, or for the intent to yield his wife his debt of his body, eke when he will not visit the sick, or the prisoner, if he may, eke if he love wife, or child, or other worldly thing more than reason requireth, eke if he flatter or blandish more than he ought for any necessity, Eek if he minish or withdraw the alms of the poor. Eek if he prepare his meat more deliciously than need is, or eat it too hastily by gluttony. Eek if he talk vanities in the church or at God's service, or that he be a talker of idle words of folly or villainy. For he shall yield account of them at the day of doom. Eek when he promiseth or assureth to do things that he may not perform, eke when that by lightness of folly he misseeth or scorneth his neighbor, eke when he hath any wicked suspicion of thing, that he wot of it no soothfastness, these things and more without number be sins, as saith St. Augustine. Now it is necessary to tell which be deadly sins, that is to say, chieftains of sins, for as much as all they run in one leash, but in diverse manners. Now be they called chieftains, for as much as they be chief, and of them spring all other sins. The root of these sins, then, is pride, the general root of all harms. For of this root spring certain branches, as ire, envy, sloth, avarice, or covetousness, gluttony, and lechery, 
and each of these sins hath his branches and its his twigs, as shall be declared in their chapters following. And though so be that no man can tell utterly the number of the twigs and of the harms that come of pride, yet will I show a part of them as ye shall understand. There is inobedience, vaunting, hypocrisy, despot, arrogance, impudence, swelling of heart, insolence, elation, impatience, strife, contumacy, presumption, irreverence, pertinacity, vainglory, and many another twig that I cannot tell nor declare. And yet, moreover, there is a privy species of pride that waiteth first to be saluted ere he will salute although he be less worthy than that other is, and eke he expecteth, or desireth, to sit or to go above him in the way, or kiss the packs, or be incensed, or go to offering before his neighbor, and such like things against his duty peradventure, but that he hath his heart and his intent in such a proud desire to be magnified and honored before the people. Now be there two manner of prides. <clears throat> the one of them is within the heart of a man, and the other is without. Of which, soothly, these foresaid things, and more than I have said, appertain to pride that is within the heart of a man, and there be other species of pride that be without. But, nevertheless, the one of these species of pride is sign of the other, right as the gay bush at the tavern is sign of the wine that is in the cellar, and this is in many things, as in speech and countenance, and outrageous array of clothing. For certes, if there had been no sin in clothing, Christ would not so soon have noted and spoken of the clothing of that rich man in the gospel. And St. Gregory saith that precious clothing is culpable, for the dearness of it, and for its softness, and for its strangeness, and disguising, and for the superfluity, or for the inordinate scantness of it. Alas, may not a man see in our days the sinful costly array of clothing, and, namely, into such superfluity, or else into disordinate scantness. As to the first sin, in superfluity of clothing, which that maketh it so dear to the harm of the people, not only the cost of the embroidering, the disguising, indenting or barring, owning, paling, winding or banding, and similar waste of cloth and vanity, but there is also the costly lining or edging with fur in their gowns, so much punching of chisels to make holes, so much cutting of shears with the superfluity, in length of the foresaid gowns, trailing in the dung and in the mire, on horse and eke on foot, as well of man as of woman, that all that trailing is verily wasted, consumed, threadbare, and rotten with dung, rather than it is given to the poor, to great damage of the foresaid poor folk, and that in sundry wise, this is to say, the more that cloth is wasted, the more must it cost to the poor people for the scarceness. And furthermore, if so be that that they would give such punched and, and dagged clothing to the poor people, it is not convenient to wear for their estate, nor sufficient to help their necessity to keep them from the distemperance of the firmament. Upon the other side, to speak of the horrible, disordinate scantness of clothing, as be these cutted slops, or hands-lines, or breeches, that through their shortness cover not the shameful member of man, to wicked intent, alas, some of them show the boss, and the shape of the horrible, swollen members, that seem like to the malady of hernia, in the wrapping of their hosen, and eke the buttocks of them, that fair, as it were, the hinder part of a she-ape in the full of the moon, and moreover the wretched swollen members that they show through disguising in departing of their hosen in white and red seemeth 
that half their shameful privy members were flayed and if so be that that they depart their hosen in other colours as in white and blue or white and black or black and red and so forth then seemeth it by variance of colour that the half part of their privy members be corrupt by the fire of saint anthony or by canker or other such mischance and of the hinder part of their buttocks it is full horrible to see for certes in that part of their body where they purge their stinking odour that foul part show they to the people proudly in despite honesty jesus christ and his friends observe to show in his life now as of the outrageous array of women god wot that though the visages of some of them seem full chaste and gentle yet notify they in their array of attire licorousness and pride i say not that honesty reasonable and appropriate style and clothing of man or woman unconvenable but certes the superfluity or disordinate scarcity of clothing is reprovable also the sin of their ornament or of apparel as in things that appertain to riding as in too many delicate horses that be holden for delight that be so fair fat and costly and also in many a vicious knave that is sustained because of them in curious harness as in saddles cruppers petrels breastplates bridles covered with precious cloth and rich bars and plates of gold and silver for which god saith by zechariah the prophet i will confound the riders of such horses these folk take little regard of the riding of god's son of heaven and of his harness when he rode upon an ass and had no other harness but the poor clothes of his disciples nor we read not that ever he rode on any other beast i speak this for the sin of superfluity and not for reasonable honesty when reason it requireth and moreover certes pride is greatly notified in holding of great retinue of servants when they be of little profit or of right no profit and especially when that menius violent and harmful to the people of arrogance of high lordship or by way of office for certes such lords sell then their lordship to the devil of hell when they sustain the wickedness of their meanie or else when these folk of low degree as they that hold hostelries sustain theft of their hosteliers and that is in many manner of deceits that manner of folk be the flies that follow the honey or else the hounds that follow the carrion such foresaid folk strangle spiritually their lordships for which thus saith david the prophet wicked death may come unto these lordships and god give that that they may descend into hell down for in their houses is iniquity and shrewdness and piety and not god of heaven and certes but unless they do amendment right as god gave his blessing to laban by the service of jacob and to pharaoh by the service of joseph right so god will give his condemnation to such lordships as sustain the wickedness of their servants unless they come to amendment pride of the table worketh harm eke full oft for certes rich men be called to feasts and poor poor folk be put away and rebuked also in excess of divers meats and drinks and especially such manner bake meats and dish meats burning of wild fire and painted and castled with paper and similar waste so that it is abuse to think and eke in too great preciousness of vessel plate and curiosity of minstrelsy by which a man is stirred more to the delights of luxury if so be that he set his heart the less upon our lord jesus christ certain it is a sin and certainly the delights might be so great in this case that a man might easily fall by them into deadly sin now be there three manners of humility 
as humility in heart, and another in the mouth, and the third in works. The humility in the heart is in four manners. The one is when a man holdeth himself as not worth before God of heaven. The second is when he despiseth no other man. The third is when he recketh not though men hold him not worth. The fourth is when he is not sorry for his humiliation. Also the humility of mouth is in four things. In temperate speech, in humility of speech, and when he confesseth with his own mouth that he is such as he thinketh that he is in his heart. Another is when he praiseth the bounty or goodness of another man, and nothing thereof diminisheth. Humility eke in works is in four manners. The first is when he putteth other men before him. The second is to choose the lowest place of all. The third is gladly to assent to good counsel. The fourth is to stand gladly by the judgment of his sovereign, or of him that is higher in degree, certain. This is a great work of humility. After avarice cometh gluttony, which is expressed against the commandment of God. Gluttony is unmeasurable appetite to eat or to drink, or else to do in aught to the unmeasurable appetite and disordered craving to eat or drink. This sin corrupted all this world, as is well showed in the sin of Adam and of Eve. Look also what saith St. Paul of gluttony. Many, saith he, go of which I have oft said to you, and now I say it weeping, that they be enemies of the cross of Christ, of which the end is death, and of which their stomach is their God and their glory. In confusion of them that so take delight in earthly things, he that is accustomed or addicted to the sin of gluttony, he may no sin withstand. He must be in bondage of all vices, for it is the devil's lurking place where he hideth him in and resteth. This sin hath many species. The first is drunkenness, that is, the horrible sepulture of man's reason. And therefore, when a man is drunken, he hath lost his reason, and this is deadly sin. But soothly, when that a man is not wont to strong drink, and peradventure knoweth not the strength of the drink, or hath feebleness in his head, or hath labored through which he drinketh the more, although he be suddenly caught with drink, it is no deadly sin but venial. The second species of gluttony is that the spirit of a man waxeth all troubled for drunkenness, and bereaveth a man the discretion of his wit. The third species of gluttony is when a man devoureth his meat, and hath no rightful manner of eating. The fourth is when, through the great abundance of his meat, the humors of his body be distempered. The fifth is forgetfulness by too much drinking, for which a man sometimes forgetteth by the morrow what he did at eve. In other manner, be distinct the species of gluttony after St. Gregory. The first is for to eat or drink before time. The second is when a man getteth him too delicate meat or drink. The third is when men take too much over immoderately. The fourth is curiosity with great intent, pains to make an apparel prepare his meat. The fifth is for to eat too greedily. These be the five fingers of the devil's hand by which he draweth folk to the sin. Against gluttony the remedy is abstinent, as saith Galen. But that I hold not meritorious, if he do it only for the health of his body. St. Augustine will that abstinence be done for virtue, and with patience. Abstinence, saith he, is little worth, but if unless a man have good will thereto, and but it be enforced by patience and by charity, and that men do it for God's sake, and in hope to have the bliss in heaven, the fellows of abstinence be temperance, 
that holdeth the mean in all things, also shame that esqueth all indecency, impropriety, sufficiency, that seeketh no rich meats, nor drinks, nor doth no force of no outrageous apparelling of meat, moderation, also that restraineth by reason the unmeasurable appetite of eating, soberness also that restraineth the outrage of drink, sparing also that restraineth the delicate ease to sit long at meat, wherefore some folk stand of their own will to eat, because they will eat at less leisure. And thou shalt shrive thee of all thy sins to one man, and not a portion to one man, and a parcel to another, that is to understand in intent to divide thy confession for shame or dread. For it is but strangling of thy soul, for certes Jesus Christ is entirely all good, in him is none imperfection, and therefore either he forgiveth all perfectly, or else not at all. I say not that if thou be assigned to thy penitence for a certain sin, that thou art bound to show him all the remnant of thy sins, of which thou hast been shriven of thy curate. But if it like thee, unless thou be pleased of thy humility, this is no departing or division of shrift. And I say not where I speak of division of confession, that if thou have license to shrive thee to a discreet and an honest priest, and where thee liketh, and by the license of thy curate, that thou mayest not well shrive thee to him of all thy sins. But let no blot be behind, let no sin be untold as far as thou hast remembrance. And when thou shalt be shriven of thy curate, tell him eke all the sins that thou hast done, since thou wert last shriven. This is no wicked intent of division of shrift. Also very shrift, or uh, true confession, asketh certain conditions. First that thou shrive thee by thy free will, not constrained, nor for shame of folk, nor for sickness, or such things. For it is reason that he that trespasseth by his free will that by his free will be he confess his trespass, and that no other man tell his sin but himself, nor he shall not nay nor deny his sin, nor wrath him against the priest for admonishing him to leave his sin. The second condition is that thy shrift be lawful, that is to say that that shrivest thee, and eke the priest that heareth, Thy confession be verily in the faith of holy church, and that a man be not despaired of the mercy of Jesus Christ, as Cain and Judas were. And eke a man must accuse himself of his own trespass, and not another. But he shall blame and accuse himself of his own malice, and of his sin, and none other. But nevertheless, if that another man be occasion, or else enticer of his sin, or the estate of the person be such by which his sin is aggravated, or else that he may not plainly shrive him, but unless he tell the person with which he hath sinned, then may he tell, so that his intent be not to backbite the person, but only to declare his confession. Thou shalt not eke Make no leasings or falsehoods in thy confession for humility, peradventure to say that thou hast committed and done such sins of which that thou wert never guilty. For St. Augustine saith, If that thou, because of humility, makest a leasing on thyself, though thou wert not in sin before, yet art thou then in sin through thy leasing. Thou must also show thy sin by thine own proper mouth, unless thou be dumb, and not by letter. For thou that hast done the sin, thou shalt have the shame of the confession. Thou shalt not paint thy confession with fair and subtle words to cover the more thy sin, for then beguilest thou thyself, and not the priest, though must tell it plainly, be it never so foul, nor so horrible, 
thou shalt eke shrive thee to a priest that is discreet to counsel thee, and eke thou shalt not shrive thee for vainglory, nor for hypocrisy, nor for no cause, but only for the fear of Jesus Christ and the health of thy soul. Thou shalt not run to the priest all suddenly to tell him lightly thy sin, as who telleth a jest or a tale, but advisedly and with good devotion, and generally shrive thee oft. If thou oft fall, oft arise by confession, and though thou shrive thee oftener than once of sin of which thou hast been shriven, it is more merit. And as saith St. Augustine, thou shalt have the more easily release in grace of God, both of sin and of pain. And certes, once a year at the least way, it is lawful to be hassled, for soothly once a year all things in the earth renew themselves. Detertia parte poententiae of the third part of penitence. Now have I told you of true confession. That is the second part of penitence. The third part of penitence is satisfaction, and that standeth generally in alms deed and bodily pain, nor be there three manner of alms deed contrition of heart, where a man offereth himself to God. The second is to have pity of the default of his neighbor. The third is in giving of good counsel and comfort, ghostly and bodily, where men have need and specially sustenance of man's food. And take heed that a man hath need of these things generally. He hath need of food, of clothing, and of lodging. He hath need of charitable counsel, and visiting in prison and malady, and sepulture of his dead body. And if thou mayest not visit the needful with thy person, visit them by thy message and by thy gifts. These be generally alms or works of charity of them that have temporal riches or discretion in counseling. Of these works shalt thou hear at the day of doom. This alms shouldest thou do of thine own proper things, and promptly, and secretly, if thou mayest. But nevertheless, if thou mayest not do it privily, thou shalt not forbear to do alms. Though men see it so that it be not done for thank of the world, but only for thank of Jesus Christ. For as witnesseth St. Matthew chapter 5, A city may not be hid that is set on a mountain, nor men light not a lantern and put it under a bushel, but men set it on a candlestick to light the men in the house. Right so shall your lighten before men that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father that is in heaven. Now, as to speak of bodily pain, it is in prayer, in watchings, in fastings, and in virtuous teachings. Of orisons ye shall understand that orisons or prayers is to say a piteous will of heart, that redresseth it in God, and expresseth it by the word outward, to remove harms, and to have things spiritual and durable, and sometimes temporal things. Of which orisons, certes, and the orison of the pater noster, hath our Lord Jesus Christ enclosed most things. Certes, it is privileged of three things in its dignity, for which it is more worthy than any other prayer, for Jesus Christ himself made it, and it is short, in order it should be cood the more lightly, be more easily conned or learned, and to withhold or retain it in more easily in the heart, and help himself the oftener with this orison. And for a man should be the less weary to say it, and for a man may not excuse him to learn it, it is so short and so easy, and for it comprehendeth in itself all good prayers. The exposition of this holy prayer, that is so excellent and so so uh, divine, I commit to these masters of theology. Save thus much will I say, when thou prayest that God should forgive thee thy guilts, as thou forgivest them that they guilt to thee, be full well, where that thou be not out of charity. 
this holy orison lesseneth eek venial sin, and therefore it appertaineth specially to penitence. This prayer must be truly said, and in very faith, and that men pray to God ordinately, discreetly, and devoutly, and always a man shall put his will to be subject to the will of God. This orison must eke be said that, with great humbleness, and full, pure, and honestly, and not to the annoyance of any man or woman, it must eke be continued with the works of charity. It availeth against the vices of the soul, for, as saith St. Jerome, by fasting be saved the vices of the flesh, and by prayer the vices of the soul. After this, thou shalt understand that bodily pain stands in watching, for Jesus saith, Wake and pray that ye enter not into temptation. Ye shall understand also that fasting stands in three things, in forbearing of bodily meat and drink, and in forbearing of worldly jollity, and in forbearing of deadly sin. This is to say that a man shall keep him from deadly sin in all that he may. And thou shalt understand, eke, that God ordained fasting, and to fasting appertain four things. Generosity to poor folk, gladness of heart spiritual, not to be angry, nor annoyed, nor grudge for the fasteth, and also reasonable hour for to eat by measure. That is to say, a man should not eat out of time, nor sit the longer at his meal because he fasteth. Then shalt thou understand that bodily pain standeth in discipline, or teaching, by word, or by writing, or by unsample. Also in wearing of hair cloth, or of coarse hempen cloth, or of male shirts on their naked flesh for Christ's sake. But wear thee well that such manner penance of thy flesh make not thine heart bitter or angry, nor annoyed of thyself. For better is to cast away thine hair than to cast away the sweetness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore saith St. Paul, Clothe you, as they that be chosen of God in heart, of, with compassion, gentleness, patience, and such manner of clothing, of which Jesus Christ is more better pleased, than of hairs, or of hauberks. Then is discipline eke in knocking of thy breast, in scourging with rods, in kneelings, in tribulations, in suffering patiently wrongs that be done to him, and eke in patient sufferance of maladies, or losing of worldly chattels, or of wife, or of child, or of other friends. Then shalt thou understand which things disturb penance, and this is in four things, that is dread, shame, hope, and one hope, that is desperation. And for to speak first of dread, for which he weaneth that he may suffer no penance, there against is remedy for to think that bodily penance is but short and little at the regard or in comparison with the pain of hell that is so cruel and so long, that it lasteth without end. Now against the shame that a man hath to shrive him, and specially these hypocrites that would be holden so perfect that they have no need to shrive them, against that shame should a man think that by way of reason he that hath not been ashamed to do foul things, certes he ought not to be ashamed to do fair things, and that is confession. A man should eke think that God seeth, and knoweth all thy thoughts, and all thy works. To him may nothing be hid nor covered. Men should eke remember them of the shame that is to come at the day of doom, to them that be not penitent and shriven in this present life, for all the creatures in heaven and in earth and in hell shall see openly all that he hideth in this world. Now, for to speak of them that be so negligent and slow to shrive them, 
that stands in two manners. The one is that he hopeth to live long, and to acquire much riches for his delight, and then he will shrive him, and, as he saith, he may, as him seemeth, timely enough come to shrift. Another is the presumption that he hath in Christ's mercy. Against the first vice he shall think that our life is no sickerness, security, and eke that all the riches in this world will be in adventure, and pass as a shadow on the wall, and as saith St. Gregory, that it appertaineth to the great righteousness of God, that never shall the pain cease of them, that never would withdraw them from sin, their thanks with their good will, but I continue in sin, for that perpetual will to do sin shall they have perpetual pain. Despair is in two kinds. The first uh, despair, or one hope, is in the mercy of God. The other is that they think they might not long persevere in goodness. The first one hope cometh of that he deemeth that he sinned so highly and so often so long hath lain in sin that he shall not be saved. Certes against that cursed one hope should he think that the passion of Jesus Christ is more strong for to unbind than sin is strong for to bind. Against the second one hope he shall think that as oft as he falleth he may arise again by penitence. And though he never so long hath lain in sin, the mercy of Christ is always ready to receive him to mercy. Against the one hope that he thinketh he should not long persevere in goodness, he shall think that the feebleness of the devil may nothing do, unless men will suffer him. And eke he shall have strength of the help of God, and of all holy church, and of the protection of angels, if him list. Then shall men understand what is the fruit of penance, and after the word of Jesus Christ it is the endless bliss of heaven, where joy hath no contrariety of woe, nor of penance, nor grievance. There all harms be past of this present life, there as is the security from the pain of hell, there as is the blissful company that rejoice them evermore each of the other's joy, there as the body of man that Willem was foul and dark is more clear than the sun, there as the body of man that Willem was sick and frail, feeble and mortal is immortal, and so strong and so whole that there may nothing impair or injure it. There is neither hunger nor thirst nor cold, but every soul replenished with the sight of the perfect knowing of God. This blissful kingdom may men purchase by poverty spiritual and the glory by lowliness, the plenty of joy by hunger and thirst, the rest by travail, and the life by death and mortification of sin, to which life he us bring that bought us with his precious blood. Amen. And that is the end of Chaucer's The Parson's Tale.